Zaleski. And I'm Morgan Beard. And we're here to give you free advice. And you are you. Yes. You know your name. Say it aloud to yourself. Say your name in the silence. (laughs) Welcome. welcome. (laughs) Thank you for participating. We love it. We love when you participate. If you didn't participate in that little exercise, take a second and ask yourself, what am I afraid of? In what way am I denying my mortality right now (laughs) by being so uptight that I'm not even going to say my own name out loud when Rob Zaleski and Morgan Beer just did with theirs? Yeah. It's just I wonder why. I would just prompt. Yeah. Just do a little Mm -hmm. tiny peek behind the curtain. Just dip your toe into that pool of introspection. Yeah. Yeah. Why didn't I say my name? Was it was it out of fear? Did I think it would be pointless? Yeah. Um, They're not going to hear me. But you would hear you. Is and it why the is that other not people enough? on the bus that you don't want them to look you up on Facebook and then, <laughs> and then look all the way back to your prom photos and they don't you don't want them to see the acne that you used to have in high school? Is it that? <laughs> if it's that, okay. Just know that. <laughs> <laughs> Take no steps further. Just know that. Yeah, just know it. I mean, maybe delete that profile picture. If you feel like that profile picture is stopping you from saying your own name on the bus while you're listening to this podcast in your headphones because you think the guy across the way might type that in on Facebook and look up your profile pictures, delete that profile picture. Yeah. And also that guy has way different things to do. He's way too worried about not saying his own name or like he's letting listening out too. any. Yeah, he's yeah. listening. Everybody in your field of view who's wearing <laughs> those little ear pods right now is listening. Only the wireless ones? Uh, I feel like our audience is probably more wireless. Uh, yeah. I'm not. I don't, I don't have so. that in my life. Um, I see those a lot, even on kids. The kids, even the type of kids, kids that we're marketing this show to. <laughs> you know? What kind? And what kind of kids are are those? Cool kids. Oh, with a K. No. Oh, okay. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that made me feel super uncool with a C. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for giving me that reality check. You're welcome. All right, so we're going to dive right into the advice, as Fuck we've yeah. been doing, and yeah. we're going to get successful at it, right? Yeah. What do you guys think about that format? Say it out loud right now. <laughs> Good idea? Thanks for your feedback. Anyway, yeah. Rob, <laughs> go right ahead. <laughs> all right, this one comes into our email, and let me just remind Yay! all of our listeners that you can email us your questions. And you should email us your questions. Yeah, you should, at freeadvicepodcast at gmail.com. All right, this one comes from... Wants to have sex. Sorry. Wants to want sex. (laughs) Foreshadowing. You you know, you see a word twice and you're like, oh, that must be my brain. Yeah. Must be uh, one of those glitches in the Matrix like that cat that showed up twice. You remember the Matrix? Wait, wait, wait. There's a cat in the Matrix that walks by and then he turns and and then this cat does like the exact same animation (gasps) from the same direction. I know it's spooky, right? You get chills. Um, Yeah. I was at a zoo once and there was this polar bear tank and the polar bear. A tank? Yeah. Like a a swimming polar bear. Yeah. You've never seen a polar bear swim? I have. Okay. (laughs) I'm just Sorry making sure that there's some land too. He's oh, not yeah, just yeah. treading water. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was like really into the tank. Okay. And so he was like swimming around the tank and would do the same loop over and over again in exactly the same way. Wow. And we were like, is this a real polar bear? <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? It feels like life is just on loop. <laughs> I bet that would have been a fun moment. It was. For it was. You and the people that were there with you. I wish I was there. Yeah. Yeah. It was a fun moment. Yeah. It was a fun moment. I was That's with cool. my friend Kevin. He's a listener of this podcast. Oh, good. Hey, Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Anyway, do you want to start that question over? Yeah. Who's <clears> next <throat> question coming from? This next question is coming from <laughs> Wants to Want Sex. Oh. I have been taking SSRIs for depression for almost two years now, and it has really helped with my mood, but I now have like no interest in sex. Mm. We've been together for 4.5 years. And when we started dating, I was neither on medication nor depressed. Mm. So this has not always been a strain on our relationship. When we do have sex, it's always really good, just infrequent. Mm. It bothers him that he is always the one to initiate sex. And it makes him feel unwanted because I don't feel like having sex with him. I don't want to be like one of those old couples who never have sex anymore 
and are just like friends who live together. But it's also hard to make myself do something I don't feel like doing. Let me know your thoughts. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts. Um, I have been in your shoes in maybe like four out of the five ways in that I've never been in a relationship that's lasted that for 4. long. 4.5 so, years. Yeah, congrats I'm for that. I'm making it to the big real. four and a half. Making it to the big 4.5. Mm-hmm. The What is that? The uh, ice cream anniversary? <laughs> Sure. That's so fucking dumb. Okay. <laughs> yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> whatever, dude, just keep whatever just gets us to the next sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for indulging me. Yeah. Uh, um, I think let me go maybe sequentially. Okay. Um, SSRIs first. SSRIs topic. first. That's yes. That was the first sentence. Yes. Um, what you know about them? I know all kinds of shit about them. What's it stand um, for? Personally then? and clinically. Huh? They stand for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Oh, damn. Four for four. Good work. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so basically what that means is your brain has, you know, certain neurotransmitters that it releases mm-hmm. and that, that gives you all those good feelings when they're sticking around in your brain and hanging out. And, uh, what they're they're released on the ends of um, the uh, oh, fuck I don't remember exactly which part of the brain they're released from but they're released into the synapses part between of the, the neurons. neurons dendrites axon I don't remember if it's the axon or the dendrite or the whatever anyway so I'm just picturing my like 11th grade textbook with the mm. like diagram and of course I've seen this diagram like over and over again college grad school all this stuff. Um, but anyway, so the, the way that the neurotransmitters travel through your brain, it, it jumps the gap between the two, the synapses. And when it's in the synapse, which is the gap between those two structures um, of the of the neurons. Between one neuron and another. Right. Yeah. Um, when it's hanging out in there, that the availability of that chemistry is what makes you feel good. And so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs, which are a, the most common class of antidepressants, um, basically prevent them from being uh re up took <laughs> up taken <laughs> by the other uh you know whatever we decided that structure was called um and so it keeps them lingering around and keeps your brain kind of soaking in them for longer mm-hmm. um and this type of medication is effective for about 30% of people, like medication is really only effective for like 30% of people that take it. Um, I mean, there's some placebo effect, all that stuff. Um, anyway, I am fortunate that I'm on Lexapro and I've tried a handful of different SSRIs and a couple of other classes of antidepressants. Um, and it works really well for me. And so I'm super happy to hear wants to want that um, it's improved your mood. Because sometimes for some people, Ha- being depressed is the thing that totally kills your sex drive. Right. Um, but unfortunately, it does have side effects, known side effects like uh, decreased libido and uh, decreased like sensitivity generally. I mean, because, you know, part of part of depression is having an overabundance of like negative emotions and being really sensitive to the the stimuli that provoke those things and then not you know you ruminate on them you you can't get them out of your head and then you're just sort of steeped in that world but i mean i I, this is sort of you know a little bit of like my pet theory of that it kind of it it numbs several different things in you Mm -hmm. um you know your perception of those certain emotions um your ability to let go of them your and then certain physical sensitivities and sexual sensitivities Um, and it just, first of all, I want to lament that there isn't a better solution for this because this is a problem that is super common. Um, what are you basing that on that there is not a, how do you know for sure? Um, having personal experience, experience in different clinical settings, lots of anecdotes from people just about the, 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 the symptom or the side effect rather of lowered sex drive or libido or sexual sensitivity or uh, difficulty reaching orgasm is something that's like very frequently reported by users of this type of drug. Right. And so uh, do you believe in um, alternate re- treatment methods for depression? So that are, is SSRI <sighs> the only thing that will work for people that. No, of course for? not. Um, but 
I do think that in a society where we give a lot of weight to um, having something medical at our disposal that we can take, mm-hmm. that a doctor prescribes us, that will will give us a path towards, I'll feel better if I just do X, Y, and Z. And we're used to having those kind of solutions in our life. And so the fact that this medicine exists is amazing. Like the fact that it can improve people's mood, you can take a pill and it can improve your mood is fantastic. Um, the problem comes in my opinion, again, personally, primarily and, um, professionally as well, is that you can't just take the medication. You have to also be in some type of psychotherapy or setting where you are actually taking a look at what are the psychological causes, um, and untying some of the knots and looking at some of the root issues, um, you know, a lot of them are early childhood stuff, uh, attachment difficulties between the ch- children and um, their caregivers when they're very young. Um, so what a lot of people don't realize about addiction is that addiction at its core um, is essentially an attachment disorder. When you're very little and your caregiver doesn't like properly attune to you and give you feedback because they're having their own challenges. Maybe they're an addict. Maybe they're depressed. Maybe they're unavailable, neglectful, abusive, whatever. It confuses our signals as a baby. And it actually, when we don't get the type of interactions that enable us to properly form the parts of our brain that spit out these neurotransmitters and create them, um, it basically prevents us from forming them properly in a way that like a quote unquote normal functioning person does. And so you know, you rely on self-medication with different substances, behavioral addictions, you know, any any different type of thing that you're trying to, like, fill that void and make up for those losses. Um, I've been listening to some yeah. uh, lectures by Dr. Gabor Mate, who uh, said that uh, the same route applies to ADHD, and that's why so many people with ADHD have mm-hmm. addictions as well, is that mm-hmm. it's a decrease in, I believe, dopamine Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. from a sensitive child who experiences trauma that they reduce all uh, signaling in their brain and that Mm -hmm. uh, causes them to seek out more behavior, more stimulation um, to try and like turn the volume back up. That's why it's treated with uh, amphetamines is uh, just to get like more internal stimulation, more internal dopamine floating around so that yeah. regular activities can then uh, feel like amusing enough or stimulating yeah. enough. And that's, he says, the route that brings a lot of people from childhood trauma to addiction. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that, like, there's just such a unfortunate and, like, narrow and one dimensional viewpoint right now and mm-hmm. like what goes into creating a, a resulting in or manifesting in an addicted person or a depressed person or a person with ADHD. Um, and uh, in a lot of mental illness in general, like people that haven't experienced it are, or have experienced it are in denial themselves and that's their coping mechanism. Like, like they are on the riding the horse of like, this is under your control and like you need to just stand up and do better and, you know, shaming people into um, trying to correct their own mental illness without any assistance. Um, And one person who I've been really interested in their work lately is Johan Hari, Mm -hmm. who uh, talks a lot about what he sees as the roots of depression being a lack of like connectedness or belonging in society. Mm -hmm. And we're so, especially in Western um, countries are so fixated on the idea of self-reliance and independence. And it denies the fact that we evolved together as social animals. Um, And so in our very sort of separated uh, and individualized, uh, you know, nests that we've built for ourselves that are our lives 
with, you know, so much superficial connection, but not a whole lot of like deep with a tribe kind of getting people to really feel that they belong as exactly who they are now and that there's that wholeness to it. We're really missing out on or depriving ourselves or starving ourselves of of this thing that helped us to evolve and feel okay and safe and taken mm-hmm. care of and um, connected. And then we run around trying to fix our problems and medicate ourselves with other things. So uh, addiction is a consequence of uh, people feeling isolated and no longer interdependent. And uh, to some extent, yeah. Commercialized world, a- automated world, one yeah. where writing on top things of on Amazon instead of like talking to a butcher and sure. Yeah. Yeah. And writing on top of like, uh, you know, underlying structural deficiencies in the brain. And I say the word deficiency mm-hmm. without any like negative judgment. It's just those structures didn't get the opportunities to develop the way that they were supposed to, you know, it'd be like mm-hmm. if your finger didn't develop all the way in the womb, you know, mm-hmm. um, people wouldn't be like, what are you doing? Grow your finger back. <laughs> like, it's kind of the same like way of trying to get people to feel guilty or that it's so much their responsibility. It's somewhere right. in between. Um, the difference is that you can see when somebody's missing a finger though. Right. And right. in the brain, still kind of anybody's guess. I don't know if we yeah. have the imaging technology to prove definitively whether somebody has a brain like mm-hmm. a physical disorder. Right. And I think that uh, it can be tempting for some people to uh, or a relief to buy into a narrative, believe a narrative that may be true for them, but may not that um, they have no control, that they're stuck this way, mm-hmm. um, that it, there's purely uh, causes that they were born with for their depression when maybe the issues are largely stemming from environmental factors that they can change or behavioral factors that they can change. Well, we were talking, you know, before we started recording about um, AA and other Mm -hmm. uh, step-based and, you know, higher power kind of based methods for dealing with addiction. Um, And the first step is that we admit that we're powerless against the addiction, basically, and then to accept accept, uh, a higher power into your life to basically, like, take this uh, away from you and uh, surrender to it. And, um, it's, I think it presents a real challenge for people who want to hang on to like, you know, uh, no, I'm completely in control. Like it's, it's difficult. I I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit not sure where to come down exactly because for some people, a a program like that is really helpful because just going, I surrender myself. It can be really freeing and really actually empowering in a weird counterintuitive way. But then to other people, they might be like, well, I don't want to justify. I don't, I can't, I can't just like, they feel like it's an excuse to not take any responsibility. And it's actually kind of the opposite Mm -hmm. of that. It's going, I'm not responsible for like maybe, you know, the causes or the seeds of this addiction. I mean, this is just how I understand it, but, and, and giving that away, letting someone else judge or take care of that. Um, while I work on, okay, what are the day-to-day things I need to do to actually be investing in the best version of myself? Yeah. I think, uh, I like to imagine the difference between fault and responsibility. Like it's not my fault that I have this addiction, but I am responsible for it now that I've recognized it. It's my responsibility to find a program or figure out some lifestyle that causes me to stop this thing that I recognize is that I've recognized causes me suffering that I'd like to escape from. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, all of that stuff to say, um, that being on SSRIs is, which I am on SSRIs right now, as I said. I'm on Lexapro. Um, it I am is a not known just for yeah. So good. That you hear both sides of this. Yeah, um, it is a known challenge that there are sexual side effects. And so what I was saying before is like it's unfortunate that for those of us who require that type of assistance to keep us, uh, you know, emotionally uh, and mentally balanced 
that we almost have to take this other side effect. It sucks that there's not a better um, formula Mm -hmm. that that wouldn't also have this pretty substantial um, consequence negative consequence. I don't know what other forms of treatment they've tried, but I believe that there are some medications that have fewer sexual side effects. Um, yeah. So that's something I, I see this uh, question having two solutions. One, try to get off of SSRIs in some way with your doctor's help. Um, or two, uh, get more comfortable with not having a uh, sexual desire. Okay. There's a third road where yeah. <laughs> you can stay on SSRIs and try to uh, do whatever you can to boost it. But if you've been in this situation for a long time and you're asking us, it seems like uh, these things are incompatible. And before you were on the medication, you did have a sexual desire. So I think those are two routes that you can take. Maybe you do both. Both could be helpful. Um, I want to say i love yeah. and respect you tremendously oh, thank i don't you. think either of those solutions you don't want either i don't want either one what's yours um so first of all i don't think that this person should get off of ssris i've tried multiple times foolishly to get off ssris <laughs> um and yes there are with, other medic there are other medicine help? uh with and without my doctor's okay. help i've done it all would you recommend I've one done path it all. or another uh, don't do it alone. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, I, I'm um, not advising that. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So I, at one point was experiencing this and I went to my psychiatrist and I was like, what can be done? Da, 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 da. Very much depends on what your psychiatrist's philosophy is of like, is this someone who's going to be like, oh yeah, just take this other thing and that'll solve it. Or like, yep, that sucks. Like, you know, or get it, that kind of, well, you're stuck with it kind of thing. Um, I had, I tried layering on Wellbutrin as well. And that gave me other side effects that it didn't really address the main side effect. It didn't really help my problem of the low libido stuff. You're taking SSRIs and Wellbutrin yes. and that was meant to Yes, this is a common, libido. yeah, this is I a common add-on. you were on. supposed to take Wellbutrin instead or like on its own. And then you can, you have some people take Wellbutrin on its own. Um, but because SRIs, SSRIs were effective for me that we yeah. were, we weren't wanting to take away that benefit. Okay. Um, but anyway, so we added Wellbutrin and it ended up giving me, it was just kind of, it had gave me like a stimulant, stimuli, stimulized, what the hell am I talking about? Stimulated, stimulated, yeah. stimulated feeling that was just really uncomfortable. It felt like a very like physical anxiety, like you drank way too much coffee kind of thing. Um, and it didn't really resolve the issue. Um, but I did that for a while and kind of didn't really know what was going on. So the other thing I want to congratulate you on is just knowing that, you know, being able to tease apart, it's helping me with this. It isn't helping me with this because so much of what our dominant cultural messaging is, is like, don't observe your feelings and don't like listen to yourself and just numb it out with distractions and this and that and the other. Mm -hmm. Um, Buy something, pay for something. Yeah. Yeah. Take your mind off of it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Just throwing all this, all kinds of shit at us instead of being like, why don't you go inside and try to figure out, tease apart what this is and pack it a little bit. Um, and so that is sort of along the lines of eventually what I want to tell this listener um, as far as like my path of advice, because um, I don't think she should get off of it. What is your path of advice? Um, about looking at some of the underlying things going on with sex drive and, um, you know, the, the relationship and what are the other di- that emotions like and dynamics. the second road that I proposed, which what was, was the second road getting proposed? more comfortable with ha- having this lower sex drive, like staying oh, uh, on the oh, SSRIs okay. yeah, 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 and yeah. being okay with like either acknowledging the relationship right. that they're going to be the initiator most of the time or, um, just, having lower expectations for sex. I thought your second solution was like, just be complacent in the, yeah. Okay. So then let's explore the second path. Okay. Um, I really wanted to cover thoroughly that, um, this is a really tough thing and a lot of people go through it and I've been through it personally and it's really hard because, you're already on this medication. And to me, I struggled for a long time with this sense of like 
am I broken? That I need this extra thing so that I can be okay in the world. And from the sexual standpoint, I even way before I was on SSRIs, I hadn't explored my body enough, explored um, communicating with my partners enough in terms of getting my needs met sexually. And I'm not suggesting that that's your issue because my intuition is that your connection is quite solid um, with your partner. Um, but so something that you're basing that off of, I mean, just the fact that they've been together for that long, um, and that they are, you know, have enough insight to even be feeling Mm -hmm. into the problem in this way. Um, that being said, I'm sure there's room for improvement. There always is. Um, but I, uh, I had the impulse to challenge them to ask if, the relationship itself or circumstances created by being in the relationship um, at mm-hmm. all cause or mm-hmm. solidify the depression. Right. It doesn't mean that it's your partner's fault, but maybe just the mind state that you are in around them or the types of activities that you mm-hmm. do or don't do as a result of being in the relationship uh, could be a cause of it. And if that's something that you want to avoid thinking about, well, you know, why? Like, it's yeah. worth looking into. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't have details on what the nature of this depression is or when it started and what right. makes it worse. So I think that's something to talk about with a therapist. Yeah, I think that every um, when you have depression, everything in your life is something that needs to be looked at with more of a magnifying glass in terms of a potential fabric or thread in the tapestry of like. What am I not openly admitting to myself? What am I feeling? A more thorough inventory of what are the different circumstances that are contributing to this problem right now. Um, And, you know, sometimes it's just this is the stage of life I'm in. I'm in a job that's really stressful and I'm in this situation until X point or – you know, there's other stressors that can create sort of a baseline of I'm more likely to be depressed just because I'm fulfilling X, Y, or Z like obligation in my life or going through this phase or I'm grieving the loss of a loved one. You know, some something that, that is genuinely external. Um, but for me, what I've found when I've done these much deeper dives into myself to look at what are the sources of my depression? Um, it's often things that I, I mean, it's, it's, again, it's so many things. It's a web. It's a very complicated web and I haven't put all the pieces together yet, but being honest with myself about areas where I've withheld communication, withheld my truth, withheld my needs, withheld my anger, developed resentment, all of these things that are really, really hard to acknowledge and really scary to acknowledge because that's how we've been trained to do them. Um, that is can be a major underlying contributing factor. Um, and again, I I would look at you know early childhood patterns, caregiver stuff, all that stuff mm-hmm. for for you know what are needs what are needs that I've kind of told myself, judge myself for having, or told myself they weren't worth having or shoved down, um, you know, anger, the anger towards turned inwards thing of it all, where when someone doesn't meet your need and it's, it's easier to be angry at yourself for not being worthy of that need or something than being like, no, that person should have treated me a different way. Mm -hmm. Those things build up and then they create this network of patterning and stories that we have about ourselves in our mind. And then if we let them sort of sit there unexamined for years, it's the net underneath all of the shit that piles on top of that. And and everything is like filtered through that lens. Um, but anyway, we're not here to cure your depression. No, <laughs> yeah. I feel like I don't have enough information to do yeah. that, but yeah. speaking on this particular, particular sexual problem that they're experiencing, yeah. Um, I want to talk about the idea of having, uh, like a negative role model, a a cautionary Mm. tale 
couple in your head that mm. is like, oh, that's the destination I want to avoid. What do you think the use or danger of that is? Me? Yeah. Um, I have my own thoughts, but I thought yeah. I'd serve it up to you. Well, I think any time that you hold up something it, that's, well, this is what I don't want to do mm -hmm. versus having a, a positive idea in your mind of like, mm -hmm. here's what I want to strive for and here's my ideal and here and what are exactly are the backing into what are the details of that and what does that ideal couple look like? How do they talk to each other? How much time do they set aside for each other each week? Um, you know, and getting building out the nitty gritty there orients you towards Phrase fulfilling it in terms the positive. of what you do want rather than right. what you don't. If you fixate on what you don't want, yeah. you may end up doing more of those things because those are the thoughts that are running through your head all the time. And right. Because you're you're putting yourself in this headspace of like negativity mm -hmm. and like there's a there was that study where they literally they told kids like instead of saying to themselves I'm going to pass this test. They said, I'm not going to fail this test. Mm -hmm. And the kids that said to themselves, I'm not going to fail, even using the word failure, because it has the negative associations that it has, those kids didn't do as well. Like, it's the same mm -hmm. sentiment, but like the language of it, the energy of it were different. I've heard uh, someone say that the difference between confidence and cockiness is that confidence believes that they will succeed and confidence or cockiness thinks that they can't fail mm. like mm. they're incapable of failure and that's the annoying side is someone who believes that they're unable to fail yeah well, it's sort Whereas of naive it's is like, just a, like no i'm going a to naive succeed. position yeah and that's more desirable in other people yeah yeah i guess there are a lot of different sort of ways to think about mm. why that works mm -hmm. um but yeah. Okay. So I feel like I still haven't. I think it's natural though to have uh, yeah. negative role models in this. Of Most course. people look to their parents. Probably something about their parents' relationship. Oh my god! Like, yes. I never want that. Whatever my relationships are in my life, I want to avoid this thing that my parents mm -hmm. did. Yeah. So I actually think it could be a really positive exercise for you, or mm -hmm. for you to sit down with your partner and do um, to look at these two different poles of what is this couple that I don't want to be and why? Mm -hmm. What is this couple that I do want to be and why? And like, what are your ideas about that? What are my ideas about that? Where are the gaps? And the more that you can find what's unspoken about your ideas about what is a healthy relationship, what is a healthy sex life, the more that you can actually connect on those things instead of, because we often assume that, Anyone who's reasonable would think this or that about a partnership um, or, you know, what is a healthy way to have sex or a healthy way to be romantic um, and what are signs and symptoms that everything's going well or what are signs and symptoms that things are falling apart. Um, we assume that those things are the same uh, from person to person just because, you know, we've shared a lot of time and life experiences together. We think so similarly on other things. Um, but the more that you assume there's similarity, the more that you leave opportunity for there to actually be like discord. Mm -hmm. And I think anything that you guys can do as a couple with whatever time you have, because I'm sure that's another limitation of life is just that there are so many other things that get in the way and become priorities. But when the fact that you're asking this question says to me that this is something you want to bump up the list. Um, you yeah. want it to be a higher priority for right. you. And articulating that is a great first step. But then it's like, okay, how do I actually do that? Well, I have to take care of the dog. I have to take care of the kids. I have to go to my job. I have mm -hmm. to take a shower. You know, these million, billion other little things. Schedule your conversations. Yeah. I think that that's something people, a lot of people think is strange that, oh, it should just happen naturally. Like put it on the calendar if you value it. Yeah. Create a container for it. Mm -hmm. um, and, <sighs> boy. I don't know what I was going to say after the container part. Oh, that's okay. Thanks, Rob. You're welcome. Um, but I got a side point that may be helpful. Just great. That Go ahead. A reminder that uh, sexual attraction and desire fades over the course of a re long term relationship naturally. Yeah. Um, there's kind of a trade off between passion and intimacy that 
occurs and as you get to know somebody yeah. and some of the mystery is removed. But yeah, yeah you get comfort of, of knowing that person. Oh, yeah. So, okay. What I was going to say, yeah, yeah, thank yeah. you so much yeah, for saying that. What I was going to say is the more that you guys can sit down together and try to have these conversations about like, what are your assumptions about a relationship? What are mine? And, and even sitting down and breaking down the process of like, okay, when we try to have sex and this happens, how does it feel for you? You know, da, 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 da. marching yourself through all of the nuances of the things that are unspoken that we would assume are, you know, universal human experience kind of thing, um, gives you more opportunities to connect and finding new ways to connect and bridge those gaps mm -hmm. will probably lead to increased closeness, which will probably lead to increased comfort and less anxiety. Yeah. And, and then, here we go. And then that, that really lubes again? the way for, yeah, tell us about that. <laughs> for the, for the beginning of, of, uh, you know, what could become romantic or sexual interaction. Yeah. Um, because it really does have to be a priority that you make, you know, to set aside time to spend to each other with each other. And then within the time that you spend together, um, doing things that aren't just, Here's what we do. We watch a show together. We make dinner together. Mm -hmm. How can you connect in new ways? Because the other thing that, uh, you know, has been shown to continue to sustain passion in relationships is novelty. And so doing things together that are new mm -hmm. um, and having different experiences and going through things together that evoke a fear response and you get to have that fear together because that's very similar to that ex sexual excitement or, um, you know, adrenaline kind of place um and then overcoming something together i'm so sorry something fell off the table oh my god we should take a big breath oh, that was so scary wow that experience really brought us closer together yeah. my heart rate is lowering <laughs> back down um and now we feel more connected we feel more comfortable this we've both gotten through this see where you're going. momentary yes yeah, fear <laughs> space together um and okay okay we're over it yeah yeah so putting your, whatever, it was cheesy. I didn't do it on purpose. It just fell into my lap, yeah. literally. Okay. Um, but the point is, what? Rob is just rolling his eyes at me. You go. You talk for a little while. I think I made some great points. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> really <laughs> abandoning ship. <laughs> you talk for a little while. <laughs> okay. Um, on, uh, yeah, I, I want to recommend Esther Perel's Mating in Captivity. Yeah. I haven't read all of it yet, but I started it. Start with a TED Talk. So, <laughs> yeah, I've seen the TED Talk. Yeah, I think it's P-E-R-E-L or more yeah. letters than that. Uh, you know, you could have an extra R or an extra L in there yeah. very easily in my mind. And I, I would be not surprised by that at all if but she yeah. had an extra R or yeah. L in her name. Esther Perel, mm -hmm. she has a very lovely kind well, of so sensual French. voice. Yeah, very yeah. French, like a, a dark chocolate melting on your tongue as you hear oh, it. Yeah. Yeah. She's Can you do an impression of her? No. Oh, okay. Absolutely I was going to try, not. but then I was like, Rob might be How better dare at you? this. <laughs> no, go for it. Um, Something like, intimacy cannot be cultivated. No, that's terrible. Oh, I was loving it. Oh, were you? Yeah, yeah. Cannot be what? Cannot cultivated? be cultivated oh, good. in a situation where there's no passion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I just made that up. That's yeah. not a direct quote. That's, but her point like is- like something she would have said. It, right? <laughs> So what you're saying is it was a good impression. Yeah. It passed. It has. Yeah. I think she's wrong in that, though, that you can be intimate with people that you're not passionate totally. about. Totally. I mean, she's not wrong in that. I'm wrong in that because I'm saying that. She never said that. I can hardly tell the difference. I, oh, my God. Is this Esther Perel <laughs> sitting who? across from me right now? Yeah. <laughs> um, but one of the I, – I love that uh, reference because she does talk about it in a way that's so, like, real – and she's going, yeah, we are putting so much responsibility on our primary partnerships to fulfill all these different roles. And some of the roles are to provide comfort and familiarity and security and safety. And some of them are like, give me passion, give me sexual intrigue, give me mystery. And eventually those things are going to, you know, fold into one another. You can't have mystery knowing and someone total well security. And not knowing them are at odds with each other. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that's not anyone's fault that is just the natural evolution right. of closeness um, but you can do things to minimize that problem and to what well, to minimize that problem go ahead yeah. I'm, I'm just I, I don't yeah. know what they are but I'm sure that they're yeah there. yeah yeah and <laughs> read so this book listen to that TED talk I'm sure you come up with your own do ideas. the stuff um but 
yeah, so if you think about it, like, okay, how, in what ways am I, am I wanting my partner to, uh, ha- fulfill the kind of the rock role, the predictability role and, and what, and context and really fleshing that out. And you can even do that together. Like, where do you want me to be the rock, the security, mm-hmm. the comfort, where, what do we call the the road, the role or the mode where I want you to be exciting and unpredictable and shifty and I mean not shifty that's like a used car salesman. <laughs> where do you want me to be a slime ball? <laughs> um, but yeah, unpredictable, exciting, spontaneous, impulsive. Um, how will I know when you're giving me the signal that you want me to slip into that facet of myself? Because all these things are some are things that you and your partner each are are capable of growing in that direction yeah. and occupying that space or that frame of mind, and it can be a question of when and how and to what extent and in what ways. I I think that's great advice. I want yes. to add on to it. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> if you find yourself often in a uh, dominant or leadership position in the relationship, it's great to ask those questions. And it's also great to have a suggested plan if they just feel like that's too open ended and they yeah. aren't really sure. Then be like, all right, let's try this first and see how it goes where I'm shifty in these situations <laughs> and comforting in this type of situation. What am I shifty and Sal check back. and what am I predictable Pete? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just got really excited what? because your question of, of – uh, being dominated for dominating versus submissive or, you know, whatever the opposite of that is. Um, when was my question in this? Podcast? Or your, I'm sorry, your, the point that <laughs> you just made, the issue. point that you literally just made. <laughs> <laughs> my underlying life issue. Um, no, of like trying on those different types yeah. of oppositional roles is that I would also invite the two of you to sit down and explore together, or you can do it apart first, whatever's more comfortable. Um, to think about the different ways that you each express masculine and feminine energies. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the masculine energy being the, you know, traditionally dominant sort of goal oriented, task oriented, um, get things done, take care of this, provide da, 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 energy versus the feminine, <laughs> da, 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 whatever, uh, fill in the blank, whatever you think it is, whatever you think it is, it's kind of subjective. And then the cars, feminine energy, <laughs> cars, guns. Hand grenades. <laughs> Just like shit to blow other people up. That's all in the masculine character. Bear category. skin rug. <laughs> I actually find bear skin rugs very sensual and feminine. Mm, okay. Um, but the hunting, I think, aspect. Yeah. Probably masculine. Um, the feminine being more uh, creative, sensual, receiving, um, soft. Uh, I don't know. Vulnerable. expressive focused on the exchange of of love and, and the feelings of the various people right. in the room more feelings based yeah and so you know one of the things that i notice myself is that i am frequently in a role or put myself in a mental space where i'm very masculine and i'm very um it needs to be this way i'm controlling i'm really trying to control something and i need it to be this way and i get very anxious about you know, X, Y, and Z, and it has to happen in this exact, in these exact parameters. And that to me, because I'm, you know, sort of, I fall into the, in terms of my sexual preferences, a more heteronormative um, kind of configuration Fem. where I like to be uh, the more feminine partner in a sexual situation. That really conflicts with how I present myself day to day at work with friends, you know, in all these other contexts. At the deli. At the deli. <laughs> I am very masculine about my meat needs. <laughs> Give me the turkey. <laughs> Call it a pound. I don't know. Right, you just want to move your mic back from your face a little bit. Just a teensy bit. Okay. Okay. Anyway, so. We're just going to blow up people's car stereos. we cause accidents to the side of the, the bus. Road. Back to the bus people. Yeah. Um, but so listen to what is his feminine energy saying what is his masculine energy saying what do they want what do they need feeling into yours what do they want what do they need um and asking yourself what in what ways are we sort of failing to complement each other and and um provide the role that works best in the sexual context Mm -hmm. for ourselves having difficulty turning off the type of role 
that works best for us in all the other spaces we occupy in our lives. And we have so many fucking things going on in our lives. It's like often we have to be hyper masculine, especially as women to get things done. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's a huge area of exploration that I would really recommend looking at. Great. <laughs> felt yeah. really good to get that off my chest. Yeah, good. Oh. Do you have any other uh, thoughts that you want to say to this question asker? Yeah, I actually think we should try to make some like practical <laughs> suggestions in terms of like the, uh, the, exp- the initiating sex and the sort of feeling taking taking care of his feelings within that i mean do you do you want to say anything about that or do you feel like we've addressed enough of the meat of the question Uh, i i feel like i've had enough but i'm willing to if you have ideas then go ahead and say them okay then it's not that i necessarily have like oh here are a bunch of new ideas that i want to shout out but i just i think that to summarize um hitting the points of you know, good for you being on SSRIs and getting your needs met in that area of your life because that is a whole other hornet's nest that you had to face Um, and continue to prioritize your mental health because that's super important. Mm -hmm. And then here within that, within the scope of that statement is sex is super healthy for us mentally and physically. Um, And so what are the ways that within the partnership or without the partnership, you can explore sex because you can explore, you can have a sexual relationship with yourself too. And often I know that, you know, I often think like, oh, if I never feel like having sex and I try to like masturbate, I'm going to use up all my energy to to do that part of my life at all. Mm. Um, but actually I find that love and sexual stimulation can really multiply, especially for women. Yeah, especially for women. Especially for women, because men, they come you, you and it depletes a timer, them. timer, yeah. Um, but for us, we're like, more, more, more. Mm-hmm. Um, so <laughs> if you can find a time to give yourself a little love, figure out what kind of things make you feel that sense of Morgan's looseness. Morgan's wiggling her shoulders as she says And willingness this. to play, and I'm kind of like uh, swirling my rib cage around and like, rubbing my pubic bone into the chair. Does that, does that turn everybody on? <laughs> I think we got some boners on the bus. <laughs> anyway, the point is giving yourself the time and space to like feel into your own body, let alone having to do it like with a partner it is, can be more complicated. Um, and so see what turns you on when you're alone. I mean, that's something that I always recommend. What if nothing's turning you on though? Yeah, I've, I've had that before. I've had that many million bazillion times. Mm-hmm. I make all the excuses in the book not to give myself pleasure. And so notice if you're doing that. Like, I will clean the goddamn apartment before I sit down to treat myself to sex with myself. Yeah. And once I finally have all the parameters in place and do the sex with myself, I'm like, what the fuck was I doing cleaning the apartment? What the fuck was I doing judging how I looked about this or that or right. the other? I was just... Coming up with excuses to deprive myself of pleasure. Um, so some specifics you can do. Um, exercise more. Start eating foods that uh, promote the production of nitric oxide in your blood, <laughs> such as pepitas, got pumpkin it. seeds. <laughs> Rub pumpkin seeds on your nipples. No, eat them. But, but don't touch eat your them in the, in the morning because they may also make you slightly drowsy. But you're, you're trying to get more nitric oxide in your blood. You want to increase circulation get your hormones in balance the other thing too that is a real like sex killer sex drive killer yeah um which the ssris may not be totally treating is just anxiety in general because Mm -hmm. when we're feeling anxious and we're feeling fearful and we're feeling not safe that's not really a climate where we're gonna put our shoulders down release and let ourselves be vulnerable and receiving and in that juicy feminine energy of like, ooh, I wonder what happens if I do this. I wonder what happens if I do that. We're in the space of like clinging to just trying to get by and well, what if this happens? What if this happens? And when you're in that very tense place, it's very hard to be open to different sensual energies. And so I think anything that you can do to kind of relax yourself before either sex with yourself or sex with a partner 
is great. Like take a bath, massage your own feet. And light some candles. Light a candle. Throw, throw rose petals in the bed. Do all that. <laughs> <laughs> Treat yourself to the good shit. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for writing in with this question. Um, this is something that I definitely want to sit with and has has sparked a lot of um, reflection for me, too, that I'm, like, excited to do, like, the masculine and feminine shit. I'm like, oh, yeah, I needed that advice Good. for myself. Um, and, you know, feel free to write us back with any um, specific, uh, you know, further nuances of the situation. Um because, you know, we're ho- we're totally down to have a dialogue with you or let us know if you try any of the things, anything you particularly respond to, anything you're particularly resistant yeah. to. We'd love to keep the conversation going. Um, I always I always want to devote just as much time as possible and just beat the horse so dead because mm-hmm. these people are so, so kind and so vulnerable and so um, giving to us, really giving us the opportunity to tell them about their experiences and I just appreciate it so deeply and I'm always fearful of not doing enough and that's my own shit but anyway thank you wants to want sex good luck you are doing awesome work keep it up and be curious with yourself be gentle with yourself be playful um tune into that little feminine energy see what happens all right great Moving on, uh, let's go to a lightning round where all the questions come in hot, fast, striking, never in the same place twice. You might end up with some fallen limbs on the road in the morning because this is a lightning round. From Reddit, user Jack is lazy lol asks, how to make gerbils enclosure more interesting? My friends moved to America and gave me their gerbils, but they always seem bored or sleepy in their cage, and for animals to be in a cage all day must suck. It's big enough, but I wish it could be more fun for them. I put in some small and big stones, and they have a running (laughs) wheel and plenty of bedding and sawdust, and I take them out to play often, but I wish there was more for them to do. I don't really want to spend money on toys, so any DIY or garden finds would be awesome. Did you try big stones? Oh, no, they tried big and small stones. And small, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, maybe throw in some medium-sized stones. <laughs> That'll solve it right up. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so I have a rabbit, so I do have a little bit of rodent knowledge. Um, sticks. Uh, li- what? It's just a dumb toy. I, it is I'm, a dumb I'm toy, but gerbils, they're dumb creatures. You, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm laughing at so, yeah. how are you going to have fun with a stick. I guess, honestly, Chewing it's my problem. It. Yeah, there's plenty of ways to have fun with a stick. I used to have fun with sticks as a kid. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, I think totally feel you because I'm always struggling to think like, oh, my God, are my animals depressed? Is it good? Is it bad? Are they doing okay? Am I doing enough? Am I letting them out enough? Am I blah, 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 blah. So first, congrats for keeping them alive. Some people can't even do that. Hooray, hurrah. Um, Sticks. And uh, the, I mean, I know that they have a wheel. Um, but you can also use other things that are like tubes, like uh, old uh, toilet paper or paper towel rolls. Um, I know rodents that are that small that that can tunnel into things like that and actually like, you know, run through them and mm. stuff. That can be entertaining for them. Um, Maybe you have a spoon lying around that you don't particularly like to use. Yeah. I mean, just try different objects as long as and see what they respond to, you know, as long as it's not um, it, something that they would ingest and it would be harmful. Yeah. For them. The spoons probably they're not going to get them. I'm talking about a metal spoon. Right. They're probably not going <laughs> to be able to bite through that. And it's reflective. So they'd get to see themselves, mm. and you know, become self-aware. Yeah. Um, so aside from trying to get it to have like a level of psychological engagement with itself that might not be super possible um no no offense um yeah i think things that they can get into move around in um hide in they love fucking hiding um put a worm in there if you have worms in your garden (laughs) see how the gerbils react to having a worm (laughs) slithering around in their dust um i don't officially endorse that position but but why not you worried the worm's gonna get them no I'm worried that it, w- it might make him sick to, like, eat the worm. No, oh, don't eat the worm. You can't control it. You think gerbils... Wait, okay. You think gerbils don't encounter worms in the wild? You can't just, like, treat a domestic... A pet that's been, like, domesticated and bred for that, like, like it's you in the wild again. You can eat, 
Gerbils eat their children. I'm nervous about it. I'd rather eat a child gerbil than a worm. <laughs> you would rather eat a child gerbil than a worm? You? Right now? Yeah. Why? One's a mammal. I eat mammals already. I don't make a big practice out of eating worms. But I feel like in terms of the sensory experience, it would be a lot easier to eat the worm. It would be like one and done. It would be like a spaghetti noodle versus like the gerbil. You know what? I'm going to cook. I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna okay. You're going to like up. spit, roast it, all this stuff. Well, you could easily like fry the worm. It would be like a snack. It would be like a kale chip. I could. Yeah. It takes a lot of work. That's not what you're – I'm not suggesting this person make worm kale chips for their gerbils. All right. Lightning round. Uh, next question. <laughs> Hope that do, helps. Yeah. Good luck with that. <laughs> next question. Uh, from the Reddit advice subreddit, uh, Kalis asks – how do I measure the size of my soon-to-be fiance's ring finger for the engagement ring without her figuring out what I'm doing? I am in the process of getting a ring to propose to my girlfriend, 30 female, and I need to have an accurate idea of what her finger size is, but I don't know how to go about it without being too obvious. She doesn't wear rings, so I have Fuck. no frame there of reference. There goes my r advice. I cannot be the first person to encounter this issue. All right. If she doesn't wear rings, what makes you think she's going to want to start wearing one for you? <laughs> <laughs> let's start there does she even want to marry you <laughs> yeah um avoid the whole wedding ring diamond buying process if you can you know help us undo that cultural scam that's penetrated <laughs> the minds of everybody everywhere um so yeah my first impression the first thing i was going to say was get a ring that she already has that you know that she wears on that finger figure out that size that's not going to work no. so um, it may not be possible to get an exact figure for well, her ring size. Not with size. that attitude, it's not. <laughs> okay, so there's a couple techniques for measuring ring size. Um, you can get a little piece of paper and wrap it around and, you know, figure out what the length is or a piece of string. It will be probably pretty hard for you to do this without her consent. Um, I would potentially mine um, her friends for ideas about that. Um, cause it's possible one of her friends knows their ring size and they've tried on the same ring. I have no fucking clue. But if you're married to the idea of surprising her, um, you may have to just mm. get the ring, you know, a little bit bigger and have it resized. And then have her get fat. Oh. <laughs> Although I actually, I'm not sure which one is easier if there is even such a thing of. As getting fat. <laughs> if it's easier I'm to certain. resize a ring down or up, um. <laughs> But, you know, if you care more about the surprise, then you may have to just have a ring that's not the right size. I think there's plenty of ways to measure her ring, her finger, without her knowing. Um, you could also compare it to, like, your pinky and be like, oh, it's, like, roughly the same size. And then do one of these measuring procedures on yourself. Develop um, a, a fetish that involves her hand that she's not into or, or some thing that requires her hand that she doesn't like the amount that you need it like say that you Gloves. have developed insomnia and <laughs> you need to put her hand in your mouth in order to fall asleep and she doesn't like having drooly fingers while she's sleeping so after a while we like all right look i've come up with a solution that works for both of us let's just make a cast of your hand that i can put in my mouth it'll be nice and familiar i'll be able to sleep your fingers will stay dry okay and then you, so you get that and then you've got all the information for any of the fingers that you could want to buy a ring for, um, including the one that the wedding band goes on, which is the ring finger. And you take that to the jeweler. Uh, you wipe it off from your drool first, of course. Take it to the jeweler and then have them measure that finger in that way. Now, getting a cast of something like this is not that hard. I've done art projects in, like, seventh grade where we'd make a mold of our hand on um, some type of, like, plaster of Paris stuff and then paint it. You know, you'd paint all the different grooves of your fingers and. Uh, well, that's we're not going to get a better answer than that. That's the perfect answer. I could do others, too. What are some things that um, she could put her finger in that would, you know, like jello and then maintain <laughs> a perfect. You, you're not going to get a perfect mold from no, jello. From jello. <laughs> no, I don't think so. What if it's while the jello is setting? No, I guess not. Um, <laughs> it'd take a while, too. Um. I think that I think that we've pretty much offered this person all that we can. But if you want to just like bemuse 
other random ways. Random other things. Because um, you're doing a great job of that. Get her to pick your nose for you. There it is. And then hold your nostril tight around her finger. Size it up that way. And then just reconfigure your nose to that size of a nostril. <laughs> when you're you, can all those do, you can also do this with your butthole. You could do it with it's your less butthole. less precise. But I wouldn't trust it as much as my nose. I feel like my control over my nostrils. Like the face is made as an expressive. But I feel like you can't really change the diameter of your nostrils in the way that you could probably tighten and loosen the diameter of your butthole. You're talking about the first sphincter. Uh, I am. As we know, the second sphincter as is we involuntary. Know. Yeah, as we know. Um. All right. Well. Maybe someone else in her family has tried to buy her a ring and um, they might happen to know her size. I think you're going to have to choose between the surprise versus the correct size. I think you can do both. Good luck to you, bud. All right. Lightning round. Next question. Lazy eye. I have always had lazy eye and I've looked for people oh, who also have it and can relate to my issue. By the way, this question's from Lil Onesy. <laughs> L-I-L-O-N-C-I-E. Uh -huh. Can anyone with lazies switch the eye they are using? I Whoa. can. And I always have. But I've never found anyone else wow. who can. Can anyone else in this subreddit relate? Do you have a lazy eye? I don't. I can have always switch? wondered, like, would I know if I had one? But I guess I would at this point. Yeah. Um, but it sounds like a congratulations are in order because it seems like this person, Lil Onesie, has discovered a skill of being able to switch them. I have, That seems unheard of to me. But again, I'm not an expert. Yeah. So applause. Applause. Yeah, great job. Um, And good luck finding... Uh, you know, your, your lazy eye tribe. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that there's any real advice being asked of us here. No, I think it's that just, they want congratulations kind of for a, the, for the skill that they have and they want to get connected to someone who also has the same, you know, circumstance that they yeah. have so that they can brag to them. I think about you the should go skill. to open mics or something like yeah. that. And yeah. And just use your time to say, Hey, I have a lazy eye. It's my left eye. Oh, wait. It's yeah. also my right eye. Maybe and, you could and ask just people. switch and say, hey, can anyone else do that? Yeah. And ask people if they have other parts of their body that they would consider lazy. Mm. You mean like ED is lazy dick? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. Something, something less damning. Like what? I mean like. What's another lazy like your leg falls asleep and you go sure. Lazy I mean, leg. I was more, I was more of a of a joke and like you know, it's not like a real. I mean, really calling an eye lazy too. It's also damning. It's not damning's not the right word, but it's like, it, it's placing a judgment again on it. Mm -hmm. uh, David Sedaris has a great bit about this in one of his books about uh, like judging your body parts as. Yeah. Like somebody having an industrious tongue if they're very talkative. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I love that. What kind of tongue would you say that you have? Um, I don't know. Do you have an answer? Um, maybe like exploratory. Exploratory tongue. I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, of course, in terms of like <laughs> the way that you talk, yeah, not yeah. like how you eat pussy. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, my memory of that is pretty fogged. It's really it's faded into the background of all of my experiences of <laughs> pussy eating. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a I think it's, that's a good answer, don't you? I mean, you 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 like to explore topics and expound on different things and yeah. try different ideas, play with yeah. ideas. You're right. I like to learn about new sounds and new words and try them yeah. out. Accents, yeah. impressions. Yeah. Of a curious tongue. Yeah. That's great. Mm -hmm. All right. Next question. Lightning round, lightning round. Here we go. Boom. Resolved. Um, uh, this one comes from never buy Xbox. Why not to buy <laughs> Xbox? Uh, and it starts never buy Xbox. Five periods. Asterisks. I live in Kuwait and I have to buy something I can't buy. Not because of money, but because Kuwait is not in their regions. Uh... Asterisks. 
not only regions one another problem is xbox live gold you have to buy it otherwise they will not allow you to play many famous games like fortnite pubg apex legends etc um where's the question in all of this there is no question mark given okay so this this person is just they're dealing with lamenting region issues yeah in kuwait it sounds like you know how um yeah yeah, yeah. DVDs i mean are region if they could get like a NTSC vpn or PAL. something something like the equivalent of a vpn yeah yeah they need to get uh content that is coded for their region and it sounds kuwait pretty hard for them limited. to do in kuwait yeah um yeah but, i would ask i would i would look into like is there a way to um basically like hack the system so that it doesn't think that you're in kuwait you can probably mod something it like that yeah you have to solder a chip into it, though. I did this back with my original Xbox so that I could play Halo 2 a week early when it leaked the French version online. Yeah, my dad knew a guy, took it into his garage, and then he soldered a chip into my Xbox, and then I was able to play that leaked version of Halo 2 early. You know, that sounds like a porn name. Chip solderer. <laughs> chip solderer. Yeah. Because <laughs> soldering sounds like sodomy. Yeah, and then chip is just like, hey, I'm chip. Yeah. Goes with dip. Yeah, and yeah, it's like Chad and Dip together, mm -hmm. which is just sort of like cheek and lip. Ooh, it could be a portmanteau of those. Yeah, and those are two yeah. sexual adjacent. And things. like, my dick is awfully chipper right now to uh, see you. Yeah, people do say that. Yeah, <laughs> people say that up and down the street. <laughs> if I had a nickel for every time someone told me their dick was chipper. You couldn't go anywhere. You'd be so weird. I would down. be doing nothing and I would have no nickels. <laughs> You'd have pockets just overflowing. <laughs> I would need a cargo pants. Yeah. And then no more dicks would be tripper for me. <laughs> Is that a... never mind. Um, <laughs> I was gonna do a roll of quarters bit. That's all. Oh honey, that would have been good. That would have been good. No, I'm glad. Just we mentioning didn't. it is enough, I think. Yeah. We all um, get it. All right. I think that's the end of the lightning round. Pew pew Which... pew pew. Oh. Wow. What a great lightning round. And what a great slow, regular yeah. round where we answer advice. Yeah. Um, Let us know if you guys like the lightning round. Oh, yeah. Please submit your your senseless questions for the lightning <laughs> round. <laughs> or just complaints about video game systems. Please submit them. We don't care what your region is. Yeah. No restrictions on free advice. No. Doesn't um, have to be English. I'll yeah. do my best. <laughs> Send us a picture. <laughs> I'll describe it. No dick pics. No unsolicited dick pics. <laughs> yeah. We don't want that either. Um, so I had something to say again, but I just totally fucking oh, forget. Oh, no. But yeah. um, I thought this was a great episode. Yeah. It was definitely different. I liked exploring the idea of a new segment. Good. Oh, and if you're – oh, I was going to say if you're one of those people whose questions we answered in a lighting round. Um, and you want something more. Yeah. Or you have a complaint about your question being dismissed by us prematurely because it was in the lightning round. I want to hear that too. Because if not, we could do the whole show like a lightning round. Yeah. We could tackle way more questions. Oh, yeah. Here comes some lightning round episodes, guys. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. Let us know your thoughts. We love you. Hope you enjoyed this episode. And we'll see you next time. Good night. Good night. Sweet dreams. Sweet tits. Lay those spider webs out of your soft when you wake up. Oh my god, because 64 spiders a night climb in yeah, there. About eight hours is uh, eight spiders an hour. Yeah. <laughs> you get eight hours of sleep. We know, we covered this one. Okay. Um, Doesn't still even very count accurate. The ones that through the nostrils, though. Oh my god, that's no a great spiders. point. And what about those, those eyeball spiders and those ear spiders? Spiders get in the first sphincter and turned away at the second sphincter. Um, often. What's the? What are the qualifications that we think turned is away at the second? Um, I think of it like Saint Peter at the gates of heaven. Yeah. Well, if the second sphincter is, is unclenched, you know, the wire just like, slide out of the night. So if you've ever heard the expression, so the shit the bed. The spider just slides out of the